for those of you that are um, online with us as attendees, feel free to ask questions in the Q and A uh, tab, or go ahead and raise your hand or put anything in the chat that you'd like, and we'll answer your questions. Whitney, do you want to kind of watch for the questions as we go? Is be okay? Yeah. I can Great. do that, no problem. Great, so I'm Buzz Welch, the director of Eccles Global. I've been in this role for a few years now and had a really exciting time uh, managing the, uh, the function, except for the COVID time. And that's not been a happy time. So we're, we've been kind of out of business for a few months, actually a little over a year. But right now we have, uh, we actually have Oh, I see France is joining us. So I'm going to promote France to a panelist. So France should be coming in with her video here in just a second, uh, provided my computer is not too slow. There you are. Welcome, France. I'm just getting things kicked off, and uh, we have a few folks attending, and this is also being recorded. So it's good to see you. How are you? I am good. Thank good. you, Buzz, for asking. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm outside at Vondo Park here. You can see my background, right? Actually, it's better weather at your uh, Vondo Park right now than it is in the actual Vondo Park. Oh, really? I would have yeah. loved to do this, this, this meeting uh, even outside on my roof terrace so we can show a little bit of Amsterdam. But unfortunately, the weather didn't permit it. <laughs> oh, well, we wish we had some of that weather. It's been hot and dry here in the Western United States. So we'd love to have a little more of that. but. Um, anyway, welcome to those that are attending today. Uh, Franz, I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction here of our program and then turn the time over to you if that's all right. That's um, perfect. We're going, we're recording this session. We're going to be putting this uh, uh, recording on our website on this link, Fall Break in Amsterdam and Berlin should replace this one. So be looking for that in the future. So anything that we discuss here, questions that are answered will be uh, out there for the masses and appreciate it if you do ask some good questions. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about Amsterdam and Berlin as an experience over fall break, University Top Fall Break, which begins October 5th and ends the 17th. I think that's the right dates, aren't they, Whitney? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think hey. something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's Saturday through Sunday. So um, and we're really looking forward to that. Um, I have really good news. I'm going to open this up. Got this email from KLM yesterday that said that the Netherlands, well, Amsterdam in particular, is open without any restrictions. So no PCR tests, no necessary vaccines, and uh, we're free to travel to the Netherlands. So uh, that was very good news, and uh, I immediately booked my tickets. I think we're going to be in really good shape for fall break, though. So. Um, just to let you know, we have, we have, uh, we go back to this main website, we have 10 that have been accepted into the program at this point for, for the experience. Um, and so uh, we have a limit of 20. So if you uh, are interested, apply as soon as possible, and, uh, and I'll send you a deposit link, and that will put you, uh, put it together for you for the experience. Um, we're going to focus specifically on Amsterdam for a moment since I have um, France with us. I'm gonna pull up our itinerary. Is that viewable, the itinerary? Can you guys see that? Okay, so this is an Excel spreadsheet that I've put together that is um, a draft essentially of our experience in, um, in Amsterdam and, and uh, Berlin. And uh, Amsterdam is gonna be our first stop and as you can see here, we have these uh, notes that say CEA arranged, CEA arranged, CEA arranged. Now, who is the heck is CEA? Well, CEA has been our partner at the Eccles Business School now for going on 10 years. And we have run uh, our summer programs and some fall uh, and spring break programs through CEA. They're an absolute trusted partner with um, offices in key cities around the world. And they have just recently opened up Amsterdam and have named a director for Amsterdam. And that's our good friend that's with us today, Franz van de Bleek. Is that I said that right? Van de Bleek? I don't know. Um, I'm going to put your bio, Franz, in the, 
in the chat so people can look at you while we're talking about this. And uh, I just clicked on that. They put it in here. And there we go. So this information is out there for the panelists to, uh, or the attendees to look at. Uh, Franz is the program director for CEA in Amsterdam. And I guess I'm going to be quiet now and turn the time over to you to talk about Amsterdam because I'm excited to hear what you have to say. You just finished this uh, business consulting course that we offered for our global scholars uh, a week or so ago and uh, appreciate that very much. It was uh, unfortunately uh, all virtual, but I understand you did a fantastic job and the students got a lot out of that. We have had students in Amsterdam on these one week experiences uh, three or four times and uh, thoroughly enjoy the city and the Netherlands and the culture. So with that, I'm gonna turn the time over to you, Franz, and you can share your screen or whatever you wanna do. I will start sharing my screen in a bit. I will first uh, introduce myself. So uh, if you looked at my profile, you can see that that's me on a boat. That's actually uh, the boat that I owned for a long time over here in Amsterdam, because like riding a bike, having a boat in the canals of Amsterdam is something that uh, we tend to enjoy very much. So Buzz already introduced me uh, a bit. I am indeed the program director of Amsterdam. I uh, would love to have you on site over here because due to COVID, we haven't had that many students in the past year. Um, we had uh, groups of students before that really enjoyed Amsterdam. And um, I, I would say uh, because the... Uh, open and free nature of Amsterdam that they loved the city and loved exploring the city. Um, I tend to uh, explain a lot, of, a lot about Amsterdam. I try to explain a lot about cultural differences worldwide. I've seen 47 countries myself and I, I try to uh, make as many cultural insights as possible during your visit. And that's also the setup for this meeting. I have created a small presentation uh, for you, a cultural discussion, so to say. I have done these cultural discussions with the business consulting group that has been in Amsterdam or working with Amsterdam virtually over the past couple of weeks. And if you have questions, that's also a Dutch nature. You can directly ask them in the chat or you can just speak up because then we can get into a conversation not a discussion while it's called a cultural discussion. So I will actually start sharing my screen right now. And one moment. Yes, there it is. So I will try to take you through Amsterdam and some cultural differences. I want to provide you with some cultural insights as just, a, I would say, an appetizer for coming to Amsterdam later on. And then you can ask me all of those questions in real life. But for the first questions, I would like to start off with the Icemerk model because culture has a lot of visible and a lot of I would say even more invisible elements of culture and the visible elements you're going to see when you're going to visit Amsterdam. So these are the projects, the behaviors, the artifacts that are actually there in Amsterdam. So the art, the local architecture, the beautiful buildings next, next to the canals, our clothing, our language, which is different, but also our food habits, which are definitely different and interesting, so to say. But there are also very uh, more invisible elements, uh, like the iceberg model, much more is underneath the surface. And I tried to give you already an idea of our norms, values, attitudes, and beliefs in this presentation. But I encourage you to uh, get into a conversation today, but also later on in Amsterdam, to learn more about these norms, values, attitudes, and beliefs, and the way they got established in our Dutch society. So I always try to be as interactive as possible because uh, just listening to me is kind of uh, challenging sometimes. So I want to start out with a picture of what is Dutch. And these are all, I would say, typical Dutch things that you might not even recognize. So to say, I would say just pick one or two out of it and you, which you want to know a little bit more about. And I can tell you a little bit more about it because it's all typically Dutch. 
just ask a question in the chat or speak up. Yeah, unfortunately, with, with the webinar, the attendees are muted, but they are welcome to throw a question in the Q&A uh, area or in the chat area or raise a hand yes. and then we can talk to them. So. Yes, please. So if you see something that has your interest and you want to know more about, just post a question in the chatter and I will follow up on it. So it's a little quiet. <laughs> That's no problem. I can tell already a little bit more about, oh, now it went too fast. My apologies myself because I was looking in the chatter to open that up as well. So we have a lot of Dutch items and that can go from Dutch candy. So the King bar, you see the Koetjesgreep, which is Dutch chocolate to the right bottom corner, which is Dutch salty licorice. And Dutch salty licorice is, I would say a 50-50 guess almost because 50% really hates the taste of Dutch salty licorice and the other 50% really loves it. Uh, other things that I already can point out right away are number two, um, that's uh, the Dutch flag, but underneath the Dutch flag, there's something more important. That's our bitter ball. And that's a typical snack we eat at a Friday afternoon on a terrace. So that's how we tend to enjoy life. Other things that I always point out are number 31 are cows, because we have a very flat country with a lot of um, outskirts, I would say, because 40% uh, of the population is actually living in the Randstad. And with that, it's the highly dense populated population in Europe. But the rest is pretty much farming land. And number 30, we are super proud of our national team who plays in orange these days in the Europe Cup. We will play against Czechy, uh, uh, in the Czech Republic. That's how it's translated, of course, um, this Sunday. So if you uh want to see a little bit of our culture you should watch that game and you can see how we behave during such a match there are also some uh, assumptions that we all walk on wooden shoes number 27 um we don't i don't own a pair of wooden shoes but that's something from the old days that people were wearing those shoes and uh, there was a whole uh, industry around it and also uh, uh, number 37 the beer cap of Heineken we are the biggest beer exporter in the world and that's only due to that brand Heineken a world famous brand so moving forward just to give you a little bit more idea of the Netherlands. So uh, the population is about 17 million. And as just mentioned, most of the population is living in an area that is called the Randstad. And that's an area where all the major cities, cities lie. So that's Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, and Utrecht. And although Amsterdam is almost a world famous brand, it only has 900,000 inhabitants. So the city itself is quite small if you compare it to much other cities on a world scale. Next to our, uh, I would say, 12 provinces in the Netherlands, we also have overseas territories. And they're actually near the US. Because next to, let's say, the islands above our country that you can see on the picture, we also have the islands of Aruba, Curaçao, and Saint Martin, Saint Maarten in the Netherlands. And that's also part of our kingdom because the Netherlands is still a monarchy. We have a king and although he is not part of the government and is actually a more a cer ceremonial role, he is still very popular within our kingdom of the Netherlands. We have a lot of import and export partners. So our main partner you can see directly is Germany, but also Belgium. So our neighboring countries, France and uh, UK, US and uh, China are main partners that we do a lot of business with. We are like most other countries in Europe in the Euro and our income would be a average of 42,000 uh, dollars in this case. Uh, some will think maybe that's low, others will think maybe that's high, but it is also highly taxed. And I will tell you more about the tax system as well, because that's a really a cool cultural insight if you compare it to the US. So just to provide the Netherlands in a geographical um, uh, point of view, this is the state of New York compared to the Netherlands. And some of you will think about the Amster as Amsterdam as one of the major cities in the world or the Netherlands as a big country. If you compare it to just 
the state of New York, you can see it's actually quite small, like many countries in Europe. If you compare it to the state of New York, you can see that the right foot, I would say, of the state is halfway Germany and the left foot is halfway the UK. So this is how close cities in Europe are. So if you think, okay, it will be a world trip <coughs> between Amsterdam and Berlin, why are these cities taken together in one trip? It is actually quite close by. So you can either fly, go by train, go by bus to Berlin, but also to other major destinations in Germany, major destinations in Belgium or France, or even the UK for that matter. So also a little bit about our history. So, the Netherlands is um, flourished in the 17th century, which we call the golden age. And that's why we have all these beautiful houses next to the canals in Amsterdam, because these were old warehouses. Most of the time on the top floor, you can still see a hook above the window. And that's how shipments were taken from the canals directly to the top floor of these warehouses in Amsterdam. These days we consider them beautiful and uh, that at time, they were very practical, actually. Uh, there's four canals in Amsterdam, four major canals, I would say. And the inner canals are the most expensive details. And the further you get from the central station, I would say, because it's all surrounding the central station, the less expensive they get. They're still very expensive to live over there. So in the 17th century, our famous Dutch painters flourished, but we also started worldwide trade by sailing across oceans. And in order to make this happen, the first stock market was actually created in Amsterdam and the first stock was traded in Amsterdam because our shipment company, the VOC, VOC, actually was started by crowdfunding, I would call it these days, but stocks were created in exchange for a part of this company. And this is how the first stock market actually started to work in Amsterdam. So the history of capitalism could be actually turned back to Amsterdam, the Netherlands. In that 17th century, we also discovered a lot of new places actually for us. And one of the places we discovered was New Amsterdam. It is uh, named differently these days because we traded New Amsterdam to, to the UK for, I think, parts of Suriname during those days. And um, uh, New Amsterdam was named New York. But there are still signs of an old Dutch alignment with uh, the states because Brooklyn is actually named after Breukelen, a city near Utrecht, and Hempstead is actually named after Heemstede, a city near Haarlem, quite close to Amsterdam. So next to, um, let's say, world trade, we have links with Suriname, South Africa, and Indonesia, and luckily these are good that these countries are um, independent right now, but historically, there's a lot of connections with these countries. So you see that there's next to the Dutch cuisine or also a very lively Suriname, South African and Indonesian cuisine present in the Netherlands, which you will be trying when you come to the Netherlands. And uh, as already mentioned in the previous picture, the Netherlands is a monarchy since 1806. So we have had a king or a queen ever since. Currently, we have a king. Uh, one of the things also important in our history is, our, is the Second World War. Uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, new historic events, museums, are linked to the Second World War. And that's definitely worth paying a visit when you're over here in the Netherlands. And then you can think of the Anne Frank House, which is located in the central centrum of Amsterdam. You can also think about the Museum of Resistance, which actually provides you with a good view of how Amsterdam was dealing with the Second World War at that time from multiple perspectives. So not only from the, uh, the, the, the liberators of Amsterdam, the inhabitants of Amsterdam, but also from the opposing view. And you have Camp Westerbork, uh, which was one of the camps in the Netherlands, which can be explored when coming to the Netherlands to get a good understanding of what happened in the Second World War. Next to the history, we also want to provide you with an idea of the current status. So the current status is that the Netherlands is listed as the sixth number, number six of the happiest countries in the world. 
And as already mentioned, the Netherlands has the highest population density in Europe. So 40% of that dense population live in a very small area in the Netherlands, which is called the Randstad. That's an urban area where all the cities are. Maybe you would even consider it one city because the distance between Amsterdam and Rotterdam is not that far. By train, it's only 40 minutes to go to two major cities and then you even pass The Hague, so another major city. The distance from Amsterdam to Utrecht is only 25 minutes by train. So if you consider the four major cities in the US uh, lying within an hour travel distance, that would be considered maybe as even one city. Another fact is that 20% of the Netherlands is below sea level. And as already mentioned, that part is the highest dense populated area of the Netherlands. So if that's why we are focusing on sustainability, because if the sea level would rise, then uh, part of the Netherlands would be in danger right away. And another fun fact to mention, and which you will definitely see when you're coming to Amsterdam, that there are more bicycles than people in Amsterdam. And uh, I always get the question, why is that the case? Why are there more bikes than people? Because Dutch people tend to have multiple bikes for multiple purposes. Myself, I have three bikes. I have my own bike that I use in the city when traveling somewhere. I have a mountain bike, which I use off roads going into the woods. And I have my racing bike, cycling bike, so to say. I'm not doing the Tour de France, but I am exploring the area of Amsterdam on my bike. So that would be rides up to 50, 60 kilometers. So this is also something I, uh, I, I like to point out. Because what is often seen uh, differently from the US and the Netherlands is our work-life balance. And I expect explicitly took this overview because the US is included. If I look for work-life balance, then often you see the top 10 consisting out of European countries. And in this case, uh, you can compare it to the US, actually. And why is our work-life balance uh, different, I would say? That's because we value life more than we value working in order to live. And that has an heritage in our, I would say, system, how it is set up. So we have all these schemes running, all these possibilities running for people to enjoy their lives. For example, if you are um, uh, employed, you get a number of holidays. And in the United States, that can be somewhere as of 10 days minimum. In the Netherlands, the bare minimum would be 20 days, but most of the employers have a 25 day minimum. If you are lucky, you can even buy extra holidays or your employer gives you extra holidays up to 30, 35 holidays. So that means that you have the availability for yourself to re really schedule holidays with your friends, with your family, and to enjoy life. You also see that our norm for a work week is not 40 hours anymore. It's 36 hours by now. And you can see that a lot of people are working part-time these days or are self-employed in order to decide everything for themselves. Um, I just mentioned the Oh, the the uh, the yearly wage, so that was forty thousand to forty two thousand dollars, but that's taxed heavily. So if you think, okay, a good work life balance with a normal wage that would make you a perfect country, but in, instead of comparing it to the United States, um, of a wage of two and a half thousand euros a month, you will receive only twenty one hundred euros in your bank account because the first taxes are deducted already and with that 2100 euro you have to pay for the rest of your life so while the netherlands has a lot of advantages if you want to let's say become rich fast then maybe other countries are better to look at so um, to tell you a little bit more about that system, next to um, the fact that we are taxed, we have a, a great educational system, but also a great healthcare system that works in the advantage of all the people living in the Netherlands. So there's no high fees when you have to go to a hospital. There's only the bare minimum of 385 euros that you need to pay at that amount. And education, which you will see when you're over here, and we ta tell you a lot about when you're over 
over here, is subsidized. So a normal tuition fee or installing scale, as we call it in the Netherlands, would be 16,500 euro. But for Dutch residents, Dutch citizens, it's 2,000 euros a year. So that makes it really easy for students to study over here and to get a grade over here. So this was just a, a quick cultural insight from uh, the Netherlands, a good cultural oversight. And I want to tell you a little bit more about the program as well before uh, Buzz, I think, jumps in with some questions. Um, but the program in the Netherlands will look like a four day extensive program where I will take you through the city, where I will show you a lot about the city, how we live over here, how we um, eat, drink, um, uh, and, and enjoy the city over here. So after a couple of days in Amsterdam, you have a thorough understanding of the differences between the US and between the Netherlands and Amsterdam. And I, I believe that it's a great advantage that you will be moving to Berlin later on because you will see distinct differences between both countries, the Netherlands and Germany as well, and the way of living as well. So this will be a great cultural immersion in your fall break. So Buzz, do you have some questions or things you would like to ask? I do, I do. Uh, before I uh, jump in here though, I, I, I just wanna say that we have, again, taken students to uh, the Netherlands a few times and uh, it's been me or Elena Williamson or another professor that have been dragging everybody around and we are not Dutch, so we don't have any context. The fact that you, are Dutch and you're going to take our students and take us around the Netherlands or around Amsterdam and help us to understand uh, your world is huge. And I, I mean, I don't know if you can put a price on that. So thank you very much for that uh, introduction and for the opportunity to bring our students to the Netherlands and spend some time with you. I appreciate the, uh, the expertise that you'll bring to this. I do have a question for you though. Yeah. If, if you're, a student in the Western United States, where these most of these students are California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, Colorado. What what is the number one compelling reason to to you know fly for ten hours to Amsterdam and spend time in the Netherlands? What would you say is the most compelling reason? So um, I uh, let's state it clearly. I, I love traveling. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been to 47 countries. I don't mind being uh, in, an, in a plane that long to immerse in another culture. But I would say in just four days, you get a completely different cultural experience that you would not have had if you would just stay home. And what do I mean with that? You will be let's say riding a bike in Amsterdam, you will be um, in a boat in the canals in Amsterdam, you will really see how this small country has a imprint, a, a distinct imprint in the whole world and how we view upon life. And I hope to um, show you in just four days how beautiful the city is, but also to provide you with a, a a, a mindset that will maybe draw you back to Europe one day. Awesome. I hope that um, answers your question, Buzz. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I would just say that the culture in the United States is so closely tied to, to the Netherlands. Um, I don't know if students understand that, you know, that the Prince of Orange, uh, King George came from the, the Netherlands to rule England and his posterity that uh, continue to be in power in England. It's a fascinating uh, relationship that the English have with, with the Dutch uh, culture. And when you think about how um, the Dutch really explored the world, set up the, 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 uh, you know, the Dutch East Indies Company and uh, basically was all about trade, not necessarily conquering, but trade for so many uh, centuries. And that there are key industries, key companies that are they're Dutch, like Philips and Shell and even KPMG, the um, accounting firm, and then uh, uh, banks that, uh, you know, in the U.S. that are Dutch on, so, and others. And it's an amazing uh, in, industrial uh, mindset, and it's really the, the home of, of uh, capitalism and democracy. So I, and I'm excited for the Euro Cup. We'll see how you do on the 16, right? Coming up this weekend, so. 
Yes, uh, the last 16 is said um, we are uh, uh, playing the Czech Republic and then we hope to move forward. But this is, it, it is a tough hurdle to take. So, yeah. For those of you that are interested in, uh, in European football or soccer in the U.S., that's, uh, there's a great app. The EuroCup app is uh, fun to follow. And uh, so, you know, check that out if you'd like to uh, put that on your phone and follow this, the group of 16 into the finals. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's talk specifically about our program. So as Franz mentioned, we're going to spend the first few days in Amsterdam. And I'm just going to pull up our itinerary again. This is... Um, this is, we're gonna, oh, October 9th is when we leave on a direct flight. And this is Delta uh, 56. This leaves at 2.10 in the afternoon on Saturday, it arrives in Amsterdam at 8.15 on Sunday morning. And I'll tell you that, that the airport in Salt Lake is expand, as expanded as you know. And before COVID happened, we had two direct flights from Salt Lake City back and forth to Amsterdam, one on Delta, one on KLM. And uh, my understanding is that within six months from now, we'll have three direct flights, one KLM and two Delta. So it's an important hub for Utah, for Salt Lake City, for the Western United States. And uh, to understand Amsterdam is to understand a little bit about who is ending up coming into Utah and throughout the West. So uh, it's pretty cool. So we're going to be in Amsterdam on Sunday. We're gonna stay at the Stay OK Vondel Park um, Hostel. And Franz is setting all this up and we'll have a, a, an airport transfer and I'll be there to transfer you to um, the stay okay. We'll park our bags and, and then Franz will take it from there. Uh, city walk ride, light group lunch, the afternoon activity, and then a dine around that evening. Um, again, I won't step on Franz. He's got this happening. It's gonna be awesome. On uh, Monday then we visit uh, the stock market or a company, and then we'll have lunch on own, and then we're in the Reich, Reichsmuseum area there in Vondel Park. So that's going to be, uh, you know, time for us to do some uh, some cultural things around town, and then uh, on or on for dinner, and then hopefully a canal tour that night, which should be fun. It's a little nicer in the dark. It's kind of cool. Um, and then on uh, Tuesday, we'll actually ride to Zandschans, sort of. Is that how you say it? It's super hard to pronounce. I would say it's Zaanse Schans, but the S, T, and H together, like Scheveningen and Zaanse Schans, is a real tongue breaker if you're not Dutch, okay. I would say. And I still can't pronounce the airport very well. Schiphol. Schiphol. Skip, Schiphol. It's the same Schiphol. combination of letters. So S, C, H, Schiphol, indeed. Yeah. And Schiphol, don't be uh, scared. I just told you uh, all the cities are quite close. So Schiphol is just 20 minutes away from Amsterdam Central Station. So the central train station of Amsterdam. So when you land within an hour, you will be at your hotel hostel. Very easy. Yeah, I've taken the train a lot. Um, and then we're going to actually ride bikes to this location, which will be fascinating. It is a preserved uh, Dutch village that uh, goes through all the different village industries like clog making and cheese making and how the windmills worked and what their purposes were and you're actually on a dike so you can see you're below sea level and how that all works so it's a really uh, a fascinating uh, day at that uh, location and and then we'll have a closing dinner that night and then we will head over to uh, Berlin the next day we will be Heading to Berlin, and uh, oh, the next day we're having a guest lecture company visit in the morning, then lunch, and then we fly to Berlin in the afternoon. So um, that's the Amsterdam part. And then Berlin, we will be visiting the US Embassy and the Reichstag, where the Bundestag is located. Uh, there's a lot going on in Berlin right now politically. It's a fascinating time to visit. Uh, you know, I would invite you to listen to the New York Times Daily podcast regarding uh, Day X, which is a fascinating look at uh, politics, right wing politics in Germany right now and uh, the history of that. So we're going to be staying at either the NH Collection Berlin uh, uh, Friedrichstrasse or the Circus Hostel. I've got both reserved and I'll figure out how we're going to do that as we get closer. I think the hostel will be more fun. Um, and then we have a full slate of activities 
in Berlin during that time, and then we'll fly back to Amsterdam the afternoon of Saturday and stay out at the airport at the Sheridan, which is right in the airport, basically. Check into our direct flight home on Delta, and, uh, and then we should be a wrap on the experience. Um, this is the, the app for, the, uh, for you to apply here. The cost is uh, through the 15th of July, we're holding the cost at $3,500. That's for the first 20 students. And I'm trying to limit it to 20. We have a little bit of flexibility to go to 30. So uh, you know, just keep in mind that over 20, the price will go up to 37.50. We have 10 now. So 10 more spots at that price for another two weeks, a little over two weeks. And then the final deadline will be September 1st. I think it's gonna actually be a little bit tighter than that because we have to put uh, everyone up for, you know, the, the, for the uh, uh, airlines for ticketing. Um, I will say one thing, make sure you have a passport that has an expiration date that is longer than or doesn't expire before April 17th or 18th of 2022. It needs to be six months beyond the, um, the last day that we're in uh, Europe. The, um, if you're a US citizen, doors are wide open. If you're not a US citizen, we'll, we may need to look at some visa issues. If there are any, usually no issues. Um, but if, uh, if you've been in Utah studying, you should be fine. And as a matriculated student here, we're, we have really no issues uh, going forward. So if you have any questions, you can fill out this contact form or you can uh, email me directly, buzz.welch.utah.edu. I just wanna show you a couple of things real quick. I'm gonna put this link also in the, um, see if I can do this easily. I'll put this in the, the chat because this is the CEA's homepage. And uh, it's a very uh, good place to go to get more information about CEA and what they do for us. Now CEA also has full semester programs uh, that you can do on your own. And they have many locations. They have an internship program, and it's just a just a fabulous company. So, um, take a look at that. Um, so, we have a question: Is there any course or GPA requirement for this? The only requirement is that you are a matriculated Utah student this fall, and a lot of freshmen that are coming in new will not have a GPA yet. I'm not concerned about GPA. I'm more concerned about you as a student being admitted to the U. Um, there is a one hour credit class that is, will be a part of this. It's BUS 5880, and you'll receive one hour. That's an internship credit, basically. So if you're a graduate student or an undergraduate student, it doesn't really matter. You can still get credit, and graduate students are, are absolutely welcome to join. So um, other questions would be great. Let me just show you a little bit more. I put up the, uh, this is the Google Maps of, of Amsterdam that is zeroed way down into Vondo Park into this Day OK Hostel. But if I cursor out, this park is beautiful. And you saw a picture when we first came in of me sitting at Vondo Park, and it's a beautiful and great spot. This is a really nice location uh, to the canal system in Amsterdam. I have stayed down in, this, in the areas down here, and it's pretty cool, but I'd rather walk it. I'd rather stay out here in somewhere that has a little more open space. I don't know, Franz, if that makes sense or not. but. Um, we've stayed at the, we've actually stayed over here, I think at the Intercontinental or one of these others. And uh, I warned students that the highway system in, uh, in Amsterdam has a car lane and a bike lane. And the bike lane is more busy. And the bike lane actually has stoplights and turn and, signals. And a pedestrian lane. So you really need, and that's one of the first advices I'm going to provide you when you're walking around in Amsterdam, where to walk, because we have very distinct lanes for everybody. And our bus pulled up right on the bike lane and everybody got out, stepped into the bike lane and said they were gonna die. And it, so we, you're gonna be careful, <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, it's awesome. Um, I will say this, if we go from bundle Let's see if we go stay okay. Let's just have some fun here. Um, and we go Bondle Park and we do, we go out to, is it SCH? N E S? Is that right? No, it's Zons, right? Z A N. Yeah, this one. We're going to go here and we're actually going to ride a bike. 
And uh, there you go. So it's an hour and 15 minute bike ride uh, with lots of hills, right, Franz? No, that's not the case. We have a very flat country. So uh, it's either downhill or uphill and then not steep, but very slow. Um, no, we are not, that's what our way had mountain bike. I didn't know we had a mountain bike. But that's no, <laughs> So, so we're not heading out from uh, the um, stay okay itself. We're heading out a little bit more north. So the, the bike ride won't be that challenging. Um, and there will be, let's say that's also, we have to say there's public transport available, but I will be there to help you out on your bike because that's the real Dutch experience. It's going to be awesome. We tend, like we, we tend to cycle everywhere. So um, yeah, um, I have a car personally. I know a lot of people who don't. And within the city of Amsterdam, you don't need a car. We have public transport. As mentioned, I have three different bikes and that gets me pretty much everywhere within the city. It's, uh, yeah, but it's an amazing experience out there. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, okay, are there any other questions that anybody has? Yes, we got one more question. Um, yes, absolutely. Incoming freshmen are welcome to join. You just need to be registered for classes this fall and uh, be matriculated as a Utah student. Um, so any incoming equal student, any any this, any um, actually University of Utah student coming in is more than welcome to join. There will be you know a range of uh, there'll be some graduate students with us potentially. There'll be uh, brand new uh, freshmen coming in. There is one stipulation, and that is uh, the. It's better if you're 18 years old before we go. Um, the reason for that is if not, your parents need to sign off on everything and you're not, you're, you may not be as protected uh, as you would be from liability. So if you're not going to be 18 by October 9th, I'd say maybe wait for another uh, one week experience. But other than that, you're good to go. So uh, any other questions? That's great. Um, Franz, do you have anything that that you might? Uh... Yes, uh, of course. I always have things to mention, things to share. That's why uh, why we are CEA. We can always add. Uh, information to uh, or we can contribute information so as you can see the map over here you can actually see the kennels directly around the central station and these are the four main kennels where you have all these beautiful houses and we will be in walking distance of those beautiful houses so what, what do you call it uh, the kennels or the houses itself kennels kennels Amsterdam canals. Oh, canals. Sorry. Canals. canals. Sorry. Yeah. So the Amsterdam canals. And um, yeah, that, that's the that's the Western version. Yes. The Western version. <laughs> the Western US. In in Amsterdam, we call them grachten. So that's the other CH. So when everybody's talking about grachten, then you know it's canals that they're talking about. So in this case, you will be in walking distance of both all the canals, the museum. The, the windmills, which you will see in the Zanseschans experience. So even though we have a very, I would say, great program aligned, you will have more than enough of time even to see the Vondel Park, the beautiful neighborhoods and the canals around you. So if you want to make that picture perfect Amsterdam Instagram post, there's more than enough time to do so. Um, so you're able to see this on your own, but I hope to show you everything in the city um, yeah, firsthand and explain you everything about the city firsthand. If you have questions at that moment, at that time, or if you have things you would like to know, you can always let me know. You can always send me an email beforehand. Uh, Buzz has my contact details, so we are able to get you updated up to speed about Amsterdam. And I know Buzz's pictures do not have a clear sky, but Amsterdam can have beautiful days as well, even in fall i would say the beginning of october is one of the beautiful most beautiful times to visit amsterdam with all the uh, distinct leaves across the canals uh, you have beautiful pictures i have been there when it's been beautiful and also raining but uh love love it um, my wife is mostly dutch uh, i know this is being recorded i probably should put this out there but you've not lived until you have argued with a dutch woman so anyway um so I think that's it. Let me just say one more thing about the operational aspects of this. So the cost is $3,500. Uh, you'll be asked once admitted and just put up a resume and a copy of your passport. If you don't have a passport yet, 
please apply immediately. Um, but if but if you need on the application, just put up a blank piece of paper and say, basically say not blank, but right on their passport is on the way. Um, we need that as soon as possible. But if you have a copy, put that in. Um, I'm also going to send out a an app another little thing to gather data. It's going to send it all the all the applicants that have been admitted. Just fill it out again with passport number and information because it flows right into our uh, our um, airline uh, passenger manifest. So that's going to make it really easy. Um, Thirty-five hundred dollars. You'll be asked to put a five thousand five hundred dollar deposit down. That's non-refundable. That will obligate you for the entire experience. It's only refundable if COVID just won't cooperate. But right now we're in good shape. Um, and uh, the balance will be due in September. I think it's September 4th when tuition is due for fall term. So it uh, should be good to go. You, you can use credit card for the deposit and then the rest of it comes on uh, your, your CIS. So uh, any other questions before we wrap this up? Franz, thank you. That was... Uh, very, very helpful, and I'm very excited to be over there and to be a part of uh, the experience in October. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for too. providing us with the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of uh, cultural insight about Amsterdam already and to get the students as enthusiastic, enthusiastic as you and I are already. Oh, it's fantastic. I, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to be there. So, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> nice. One question. Nice. One question yeah. came in. Can you please talk about spring and summer as well? Um, yeah. And what what is the actual question? Because I, I, what do you mean with talk about spring and so, summer? So as hang well? hang in there with me. I'm going to show uh, I'm going to show this attendee the summer schedule. Um, here is what we have approved so far, and we're in Amsterdam with this global business consulting program that is designed specifically for the global scholar cohort that are going to be freshmen this fall. And in the spring, they'll have an opportunity to take this class, uh, which is uh, four weeks starting in Utah. We don't know exactly when the start date will be, but we know that we'll end up in the first, uh, first session, which is May 16th to June 9th in Amsterdam with Franz and to finish that program up. So it's eight weeks total. And uh, that's a great class. And then we'll also be in Amsterdam in the second session with our international marketing course taught by Andrea Thomas. Any, um, you don't have to be an upper division to take this class. So any freshman, sophomore, junior, senior can take this class um, and, and get credit for it. You can take, I think, two upper division classes without being admitted to upper division. So that one's available. Elena Williamson will be teaching in Barcelona International Finance, same kind of deal. It's You can take it without being uh, admitted to upper division. And then uh, we are, we're, in, we're in Barcelona with CEA, Paris with CEA, London with an affiliate of CEA, which is uh, CEA, which is Kappa, and then Rome with CEA again with Jeff Nielsen, so with the business law. So this is the basic lineup. I will be uh, feeding in some other courses in the summer that will be BUS 1051 and some BUS 3800 and 3900 classes. The Ghana experience is basically just carve out, go to Ghana and then come back to Europe for other, uh, other sessions. Or you can just do one session, you can do two sessions, you can do three. Pricing gets a little bit uh, better the more sessions you take. So we'll have this up about August 15th. We'll have the entire summer semester out there. As far as spring goes, uh, we have, uh, we'll have, um, right now we have uh, Malaysia, Singapore plan. We're looking at Turkey and Greece. We're looking at uh, Spain and Morocco as one week experiences. If you're a global scholar, you're going to be going to Paris and London uh, with the global scholar cohort in the spring. I think that's it. Any other questions? Was there another question that came up? Spring and summer travel plan. I think that's, does that answer your question? That's pretty much it. So um, we have students that take one, two, or three uh, courses in the summer. One other thing I will mention though, and Franz, I'm sorry to drag you through this, but I just want to show these guys that 
there is that we do have two minors that we offer, which is uh, global information systems and global entrepreneurship. We have both of those offered spring and summer. You can see where those locations are. Um, they're wonderful to pull yourself out of your major and go do those minors and then come back to this later on. So, and then winter break, we're going to go to Chile, to Patagonia and the Atacama Desert. So, okay, I think that's probably it. Oh, a Global Scholar. Those are incoming freshmen that are part of the Business Scholar program that ought to be in the global cohort. So, all right, I think I'm done. Franz, you're awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm just stopping the recording now.